Your Excellency, Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malaysia, Mr. Dato Sri Saifuddin Abdullah. Thank you so much for the honor of having come here today, travel all the way from Malaysia, uh, given an excellent welcome address uh, to prepare for the very excellent professor uh, who gave the keynote address. We would love to have a chance now multilaterally to ask you a few questions, and really ranging all around the world uh, to try to gain uh, also more from your expertise. Um, I'd like to begin with a topic which is in the media every day when you open the internet, uh, something that unfortunately doesn't seem to be improving, although we're hearing mixed things in the media. What is your opinion about the current situation in Ukraine? Do you see the current situation in Ukraine as a war Russia, a proxy war, some I've referred to it as? What is your advice to the heads of Western countries in this regard? What is your advice to the Ukrainian president? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, nobody wants this war, and this is something that we don't need. Uh, Malaysia is a small country and far away from uh, Ukraine or Russia, but we are already feeling the pinch. Uh, inflation happens every now and then, but we also know why uh, inflation is happening today. Uh, we are a net importer of food, but we are facing more challenges today because we have problems in the supply chain. Uh, we have 800 students uh, in Russia, and the parents are now concerned that uh, if this conflict will go on uh, for we don't know when it will end, they may have problems sending money uh, to Russia, to their uh, kids because uh, of the system, because of the embargo and so on and so forth. Now, we believe that no one can go and attack or do any kind of aggression into a sovereign state. So what Russia is doing in Ukraine is definitely not worthy of any support. And we have voted like, likewise uh, in all of the United Nations uh, resolutions. But at the same time, we also understand that this is part and parcel of the behaviors of superpowers. The five superpowers uh, have certain habits and certain behaviors. Some like to go to war, some don't like to go to war, some do certain things in a certain way. So I wouldn't say that this is simply the war between the West and Russia, but this is really um, something that happened due to the contestation, the unhealthy competition, uh, which form the habits and the behaviors of the superpowers. Now, my message to the Ukrainian uh, president is we understand the sorrows and we empathize with him and the people of Ukraine. But at the same time, we must also be truthful to ourselves that other than Russia and Ukraine, people must come together to get the two leaders to sit down and try to end the war. We need to stop the war as quickly as possible. No, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. That's right, that's right. Uh, essential. So now moving on to another tension that's growing globally, it's between China and the West. Mm -hmm. the, and it's becoming more and more visible daily. So what is the position of Malaysia on this issue? And how do you personally think that the international community can resolve the tension that China is now experiencing? Well, if the United that if the UN Security Council works in the real sense of the word, then probably we don't have this tension. But because the UN Security Council is not uh, working uh, as we aspire it to work, so we have this tension. But beyond that, as a small country again, and ASEAN as a whole, is trapped between two big elephants. So we are like the mouse deer <laughs> between the two elephants. Now, the biggest issue here is everyone, including the US and China, wants to have a say on South China Sea. That is the crux of the matter. Now, Malaysia believes and we uphold the principles under the UNCLOS, mm -hmm. uh, free navigation and free overflight, and we want uh, South China Sea and the region to be a region of peace, 
and a region of prosperity where everyone can come and trade. Uh, we, I used to say that there are the three T's. You know? One is trade, uh, the second T is technology. By all means, let's compete in trade and in technology. What we don't want is the third T, that is the threat. And the threat can come from many, many ways. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was one incident where two battleships, one from the US and one from China, were just 100 meters apart. Now, for people who understand uh, how uh, the Navy, or uh, how things happen or works uh, in the open uh, ocean, they will understand that even though it is 100 meters, like it's so far apart for ordinary people like us, but two big battleships, 100 meters apart, is like almost colliding. Mm -hmm. Luckily, nothing happened. Yeah. So we have always made this call to both uh, the, the the US and China that please, uh, we do not want to escalate matters. We do not want to create tension. Uh, we want uh, everybody to honor the fact that this sea belongs to everybody. And every time uh, we have this uh, unhealthy competition, then it will be the small countries uh, that will suffer. Now, Malaysia believes in a multipolar world. And it is in this context that every time I meet up with my colleagues from the EU, then I will be repeating the same call that we would love to see the EU playing some kind of role uh, in the affairs of the region, not because of anything else, but to balance this unhealthy competition or the contestation between, never mind if you say it is the West versus China, but I think it's between US and China. We would love to see uh, an active, and the EU is one of ASEAN dialogue partner, mm -hmm. and we, we put a lot of importance uh, to, to the fact that the EU is uh, one of the important uh, dialogue partners in ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to come back to cultural diplomacy for a moment. Mm -hmm. You made clear in your statements earlier, cultural diplomacy is very important for you, which is great. How important is cultural diplomacy for Malaysia, do you think, uh, in terms of the overall country? Are there really benefits? Will this have a positive impact on Malaysia? As you also pointed out, this is, didn't start today. Uh, and actually, in many ways, Malaysia has been practicing cultural diplomacy for a long time. Maybe mm. it wasn't called cultural diplomacy. Maybe there wasn't a cultural diplomacy department. Mm. So I'd love it if you could give maybe one or two examples. Uh, if you look at the different religions, the different cultures, the multiculturalism as a whole of mm. Malaysia, mm -hmm. one or two examples where you say, okay, here, cultural diplomacy worked. Here, it had an impact. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, when I talk about cultural diplomacy, uh, we, official, we officially uh, launched this project in December last year. But as you correctly said, that uh, it doesn't mean that we have never done cultural diplomacy before. Uh, perhaps it was even conducted by our ministry, uh, but not as something that is very uh, systematically organized. Uh, I'm sure the Ministry in Charge of Tourism and Culture has organized uh, numerous programs which can be categorized as cultural diplomacy. And in the past, we have also been involved uh, in some of the conflict resolution work in the region, particularly in the southern of the Philippines and the southern of Thai, uh, southern of Thailand. Now, but why, why the need for us to formalize this work? I think it is for a couple of reasons. Number one, in today's world, when many systems seem to fail, I'm referring to the political architecture, uh, international security architecture, international finance and trade architecture, I think uh, this is where uh, cultural diplomacy would probably play a more important role than it was before. And we are learning from experiences of our neighbors, uh, Thailand, Indonesia. Uh, nearer, uh, further a bit would be South Korea. And of course, Germany. Uh, we have seen how some of your organizations have been working 
uh, in Malaysia and in the region uh, in the area of education, in the area of uh, democracy and freedom and uh, civic mindedness and things like that. So uh, we feel that it is about time that we systematically uh, plan our cultural diplomacy program uh, and this will include uh, a whole spectrum of things uh, from the performing arts uh, like songs and movies, music, uh, dance, to food, the culinary, uh, to textile and things like that. But also equally important, or for some people this is even more important, is the sharing of ideas uh, in the area of academic, in the area of thoughts, uh, in the area of research. And this should also include sports, for example. And we know that this is very useful. Uh, I remember <laughs> this uh, earlier on I was talking about the example of the uh, South Korean president uh, when he spoke at the UNGA uh, last year. Part of his speech was you know, given to the seven young men uh, of BTS, the K-pop. And uh, the last three minutes of the K-pop presentation was a video showing them uh, dancing in the hall. Obviously, it was recorded earlier, but that's cultural diplomacy at work. And how many Europeans uh, know South Korea, but they buy Samsung handphone, uh, not because they know that the technology is uh, better than uh, the other handphones or the other brands, but because they thought, ah, this is a, a Korean uh, product, must be cool. How do they know Korea? If they are young men, they probably know uh, Blackpink. If they are young women, they probably know uh, K-pop. Uh, sorry, uh, BTS. Yeah. So that's cultural diplomacy in motion. And Qatar is using sports diplomacy to the full. Um, there is a book. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the author, but he is teaching in, I think, Georgetown University in Doha. Uh, the title of the book is Qatar, Small Country, Big Politics. And he talks about how Qatar wants to play a role in international affairs, and they are playing a role in international affairs, in trying to uh, negotiate uh, what is now happening in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, and one of the tools that the Qatar government is using is sports. Uh, they were hosting all kinds of sports events and this year everyone is looking at Qatar because they are hosting the World Cup. Thank you very much. So branching off of cultural diplomacy and more towards nation branding, we do know that most recently Malaysia has ran a very successful campaign called Malaysia Truly Asia. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel that this particular campaign was so successful? And using that, what are your tips for countries who are trying to run similar nation branding campaigns in order to help them improve their tourism and their foreign investments? The Malaysia Truly Asia uh, motto or tagline uh, would not work if the people of Malaysia doesn't leave the cultures of Asia. You just can't brand it. Yeah? You can only brand it because the product is there. So it suits our country, it suits our identity because we are multiracial, we are multicultural, we are multi-religious. Uh, the main religions of the world are all there in Malaysia. We have the main, uh, what they call, uh, ethnic groups of Asia, the Malays, the Chinese and the Indians. They are all in Malaysia. So yes, uh, we are uh, practicing an Asian culture and because of that, uh, that tagline works. The current government is using Keluarga Malaysia, uh, translated into English will mean uh, the Malaysian family. And again, uh, the Malaysian family is about uh, people of different backgrounds. Uh, so we celebrate multiculturalism. Uh, in the real sense of the word. 
And when it comes to cultural diplomacy, we would like to park it. I mean, if there is such thing as parking uh, cultural diplomacy within the discourse that we understand as multilateralism. Uh, the other way of looking at it, and something that we also talk about uh, in Malaysia, is about peaceful coexistence. The fact that uh, all these major religions and major ethnic groups can work, can live together peacefully and harmoniously. You see, in 1957, when we achieved independence, not many people give Malaysia a chance because we have all the religions and all the big ethnic groups. This was recipe for disaster, but we, we managed. And I think we're very proud of that. And I think this is something that we want to share with the rest of the world while we also learn. I mean, we learn about your 1989 big event of unification, uh, something that was very historical, not only for the people of German, as I understand it, it is so for the whole world. I mean, it's a huge step forward. And that would not happen. Okay, maybe it could have happened because a few leaders decided to break down the wall. If the people were not receptive to the idea, they may not rebuild the wall, but they will, be, they will build artificial walls that would further uh, you know, uh, uh, make them, uh, you know, uh, separated. Yeah. Well, it's true, and I've spoken to many also East and West Berliners, and when the wall came down, that was, of course, an important step. But the psychological wall uh, was still there for many, mm. and that took actually, in some cases, generations and decades. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important point. And I appreciated your reflections also on nation branding. As you said, cultural diplomacy, on the one hand, used to be unilateral. Uh, if I'm French, I want to tell you about French culture, and I want to bring you French language. But now it's uh, about sharing. Then it became bilateral, which is, yes. of course, more interesting, with academic exchange, et cetera, going in both directions. As you pointed out, what I find the most effective and most interesting is what the European Union is doing, multilateral. Exactly. Uh, let's bring the borders down. Let's make it easier for exchange. Let's exactly. make it easier for these kinds of things. So exactly. I definitely see that's the way it's evolving. Mm -hmm. I want to come back with the final question to nation branding. And in this case, maybe give you a chance to do some nation branding. I want to ask you three questions. Uh, <laughs> and in your answers, hopefully you will attract us all to, to come immediately to Malaysia. First of all, what can Malaysia offer young people who would like to visit and live in Malaysia? Secondly, what can Malaysia offer to foreign investors if they're thinking of investing in Malaysia? And thirdly, what can Malaysia offer to the world? Wow, this is probably the toughest three Big questions. Question. <laughs> but <laughs> the most important. Yeah, so. Very important. Yeah. What can Malaysia offer to young people who would like to visit and live in Malaysia? Malaysia is an open society that embraces different cultures. Diversity to us is a strength. It's a source of strength. It's not a sign of weakness and a sign of a problem. So we are a very open society that can accept people from all over the world. So please, uh, we will welcome people. We already have thousands of students from probably more than 100 countries studying in Malaysia. And we would love to host more uh, students uh, to come to Malaysia. What can Malaysia offer to foreign investors? I think if there is one word that can represent Malaysia is stability. You know, in 2018, for the first time ever, we have a change of government in the real sense of the word. A different party, an opposition coalition took over the government. No, nobody went to the street. Nobody go to the streets. 22 months later, there was another change of government. Nobody go to the streets. 17 months later, another government was formed. Nobody went to the street. I think Malaysia celebrate, cherish, and put a lot of premium on this word, stability. So stability is something that we can more or less guarantee to foreign investors. What can Malaysia offer to the world? Peaceful coexistence as a concept. I know uh, I have been uh, reminded that peaceful coexistence is a term that was used during the Cold War. Uh, it originated from mm, this part of the world, but uh, our peaceful coexistence is something else. 
this is about knowing the other, celebrating the other, and to be able to live together in peace and harmony with the other, uh, as a family, uh, like your brother, like your sister. And this is something we feel we have done quite well. Yes, we do have our pockets of problems here and there, but on the whole, as I said, in 1957, when we achieved independence, no one gave us a chance, but we are here now, and we are still, uh, well, uh, doing quite well, and perhaps this is something that we can offer to the world. No, oh, thank you very much for those messages, and I think the, the answers you just gave to those questions, one could consider having as maybe the core of those cultural diplomacy programs that you're in the process of building. So as I said, if we can be helpful in any way, I'm happy to have dialogue with you, with the embassy. I think it's an exciting moment for Malaysia. Uh, we appreciate your initiatives in December to, to get this going, and we very much look forward to seeing how it all evolves. But thank well, you again. I look forward to working with you in this area. Wonderful. Thank you again very much for the honor of having come today. It was an excellent event. And thank you. And also for the interview. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you right. so much. Okay.